Section 1.1 of the textbook is a quick introduction to some of the main concepts that we'll see throughout the rest of this first chapter, the financial math chapter. So I want to give you a quick overview of the main concepts that you'll see here, and you can read through this in detail on your own. The big picture is summed up more or less by this statement here, that money is expected to grow over time. That's one of the core concepts that will run throughout this entire chapter, and the implications of that will lead to some of the calculations that we need to do. I have the example here of Warren Buffett as someone who, over time, by investing and reinvesting, has built a huge fortune, and it all comes back to this core idea that, over time, if you have money that you can invest in something, if you can pour money and perhaps time into some business or some venture, you can hope to see a return that gives you more money back at the end than you started with if your investments are successful. Of course, there's risk and you can lose money, but in general, the goal of investing and running businesses is to multiply or to grow a certain amount of money that you start with. So you have a starting investment that you hope to see grow over time. Now, if everyone's doing this, over time you can see a general trend in the cost of goods, for instance, or in the stock prices of major companies like we have here. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is kind of a marker for how well the stock market is doing. And you can see some dips throughout time, including a big one here during the recession back in 2007. But the overall trend is that it's increasing as time goes on. And so despite all of the little peaks and valleys, in general, the stock market is growing. And so if you invest money, you can expect to see it grow along with that. Because of that, we come across an idea known as the time value of money, meaning there's value to holding on to money today, not just because of what it can buy for you, but because if you have the opportunity to invest that, you can earn more money. And so the money itself can make more money for you through proper investments. So there's a value to having money today and you expect in the future that that money will have grown. So this is why you don't take money and stick it under your mattress. You want to put it to work for you so that it will earn money for you through different investments. And I have the example here of running a small landscaping business. That's just one example of how you could take a starting investment and turn that into a larger amount of money. So we're gonna talk about specifics later in the chapter. We'll have some formulas to calculate specifically how money is expected to grow, but the basic concept is one that you can understand now that, for instance, $100 today might be expected to be worth a, a little bit more, $110 in a year. In that example, we would say, for instance, the present value is $100 and the future value is $110. So those terms, present value and future value, are ones that you're going to see all throughout the rest of this chapter. And it's important to understand what we mean by that. What we mean is in a situation where we're saving money or borrowing money, there is a starting value and then there's an amount at the end that we'll either earn back from our investment or if we're borrowing money, we'll have to pay money back at the end and that would be the future value. So you'll see present value and future value all throughout this chapter and it's important to understand what we mean by that. Now because everyone is expecting to see this kind of result where we uh, can start with a small pile of money and make it into a larger pile. Because of that, there is value to holding money right now. In other words, if you want to borrow money, you need to pay someone to replace the uh, amount they could have made from that. So if you're going to borrow $100 from somebody, you need to pay them back for not only the $100 you borrowed, but also the amount that they could have made by investing it somewhere. So it's almost like renting their money. You have to pay it back, but also you have to pay for that privilege of holding on to it for some amount of time. 
And that's where we get this idea of interest. And that's why when we borrow money, we pay interest back. Or when we uh, invest money, we can expect to see a return because it's kind of the same situation in reverse. Instead of borrowing somebody else's money, we let somebody else borrow our money. And then we expect them to pay us interest on top of that. So you'll see some terminology in different examples. As we look at loans, you'll have, for instance, the principal. That just means the amount of money that someone borrowed at the beginning of the process. So if you're taking out a loan, the principal would be the amount that you borrow. If you are investing money, the principal would be the amount you start with and you put into the account to invest. So for instance, if you're buying a car, let's say you want to buy a $10,000 car. If you have $2,000, the remaining $8,000 you'll have to borrow. So the principal on your loan would be $8,000, and then you'd have to pay that back over time. Then you'll see, of course, interest. That's the amount that's added to the principal. So you have to pay off the principal, but you also have to pay off interest uh, during this loan problem. And then you'll see, for instance, the term life of the loan. That just means how long this process goes on. So you might pay off the loan at the end of 10 years, or you might pay it off slowly over the course of 10 years, or whatever length of time is relevant to the problem. Then when we think more about interest, you can read this in detail, but the basic conclusion is what makes sense is to define interest as a percentage of the principal. So if you borrow more, you have to pay more interest. If you borrow less, you have to pay less interest. So interest is a percentage of the principal. Usually somewhere between zero and 10% or so, depending on what kind of loan you're talking about. But if you're talking about things like credit cards, for instance, those interest rates can go up to 25% or something uh, much higher. But interest is always defined as a percentage of the principal. So it's important then that we can work with percentages. A lot of what we're going to do when we do calculations is going to use percentages. So it's important that you're comfortable transitioning back and forth between a percentage and a decimal. Because a percentage is really just a way of describing an amount. When you're actually doing calculations, you need to use decimals. If you want to find 50% of something, you need to multiply it by the decimal form of 50% which is 0.5. So there's a few problems here to practice with percentages and getting comfortable with them. You should go through and do these examples. Make sure you're comfortable with them. And if you need more practice, there's a section in the algebra review chapter that has more examples of converting between percentages and decimals. But ideally, you'll get to a place where you can kind of do this quickly and naturally. If I tell you we're working with 8% interest, mentally you should recognize that that's going to be 0.08 and we actually do calculations. That's the decimal form. So 8%, 8 hundredths. So there's an 8 in the hundredths place, 0.08 and so on. So you should practice with these examples just to make sure that you're comfortable working with percentages because the calculations we do uh, will work with decimals where the problems will state the interest rate as a percentage and we'll need to mentally or um, on paper convert that to a decimal so we can do calculations. So that's it for section one. It's pretty brief, just kind of setting up some of the ideas and then there's a quick introduction to the other sections at the end and we'll get into those throughout the rest of the chapter.